Well, first of all, welcome to the World Rugby Fan Fest tonight. It's uh, great to have everybody here. Uh, my name is Lanny Cohen, and I'm the Chief Innovation Officer for Capgemini, uh, and uh, we're your host tonight. I'm also uh, the co-founder of the Applied Innovation Exchange, um, and it's a real honor to have everyone here tonight. This is a, an amazing crowd, and it'll be, I'm sure, an amazing evening for everyone. Um, the first thing I want to do is I, I want to call out, and, and I hate to embarrass or kind of be hokey, but uh, any of the past presenters who have been uh, uh, presenters in AIE, uh, what's now San Francisco event, can you guys just stand up for a second? And don't be bashful. I know there are a bunch of you in the room. Yeah. So, so thank you all for coming back. It's a real, it's a real pleasure, and trust me, I think we're, we're blessed to have you as part of the, kind of this, this alumni group, and the fact that you, you come back time and time again as participants as well is a, is a real honor for all of us. Um, what you're in now is the Applied Innovation Exchange of Capgemini, and uh, I'm sure many of you are first-timers here, maybe a couple hands if you're first-timers here. Uh, well, it's quite a bit. Uh, well, I'm not going to take the time to explain what the AIE is about, but you're in one of 12 similar exchanges around the globe. Uh, we opened up our 12th in Stockholm uh, just a month or so ago. Um, and what's also interesting, uh, we do these What's Now events in six locations as well uh, around the world. Uh, they all differ a little bit, uh, but uh, it's been an amazing program once we started it here in San Francisco. We've now exported the concept around the world. So. Uh, I'm a New Yorker, and I know how to be able to say that about San Francisco to export stuff. I know that's kind of a big thing for you, because in New York, we think the sun rises and sets uh, on the East Coast. Uh, but anyways, uh, the thing that's special about these What's Now programs is, uh, is really the caliber of the speakers, and then equally important is the exchanges that occur around them, and the networking, and that opportunity that's created. Uh, so again, really encourage you to, to participate tonight. There'll be a lot of time uh, for questions and, uh, and interactions. And even after the formal part of the program, we'll still be here for quite a bit uh, after that as well. So really encourage you to be uh, very, very engaged and, and participate uh, quite a bit. I also want to note, too, that our Applied Innovation Exchange uh, was singled out by ALM Intelligence, which is one of the research organizations in the professional services industry. Uh, as um, with Capgemini as one of the top four innovation consulting and strategy companies in the world. So uh, this is a real deal. This, this, is, a, this is a venue. Uh, we work with a lot of clients here, and it really works well. And uh, if you run into people tonight with these silver uh, AIE uh, lapel pins, and my colleagues are kind of all around the audience, please grab them, and they'll explain to you what the AIE is about if you want to tour uh, I want to know more detail of what we do here. I'll be happy to, to share that with you. Um, I also want to point out that uh, last month's speaker here, Julie Hanna, and Tuesday night's speaker in New York, David Edwards, was just another fascinating program. Uh, you can review both of those programs on the reInvent website. Uh, and I really encourage you to, if you weren't here last month for Julie, take a look at a fascinating program. And Tuesday night was also just amazing with David Edwards. So I uh, really encourage you to do that. And then last but not least, uh, there is a reason that these rugby signs are up in front of the place. And we don't sell rugby tickets here or rugby merchandise. But the weekend of July 20th through 22nd, the World Rugby Sevens World Cup is being played here in San Francisco. Uh, the women's tournament is Friday and Saturday. The men's tournament is Saturday and Sunday. Capgemini is the global innovation partner for World Rugby, and if you want a fun day, uh, truly a fun day, whether you're a rugby fan or not, I really encourage you to get out to AT&T Park. It is one heck of a sport. It's a lot of fun. Uh, you can spend the whole day there, and truly you'll have a, a wonderful, wonderful time. I, I, I can attest to that. I'm not a rugby fan. I've been to a tournament in Las Vegas and in Singapore, and uh, I know what I'm talking about. It's, it's really a lot of fun, so I really encourage you to do that. So. With that, uh, let me introduce our partner in crime uh, from reInvent, the co-founder, or the founder and president, uh, Pete Lydon. Pete's been just an amazing, amazing partner of ours, become a great friend, uh, and he's going to moderate us tonight in what will be, I think, an exceptional program. Pete?
Thank you. Um, I do, I do want to say one thing about uh, Lanny, and, and thank you to Cap Gemini. I mean, they have actually been doing this now for two years. They've been opening this space up to us. They've been underwriting this. They've been food and the drink. Tonight, we're going to have food trucks out here. They've been helping us and partnering deeply to get the best kind of thinkers from all, the all over the region in here to talk and also to network and build out this awesome multidisciplinary network that is really all you folks. And honestly, couldn't have done it without them, and I really, really genuinely want to thank those folks. Um, I'm Pete Lydon, for those of you who don't know. Uh, I, am, I am the founder of reInvent, and I am definitely part of the legacy of the whole Earth Catalog and Stuart, Stuart Brand. Um, I tell you what, I came here, I was just a little kid when the whole Earth Catalog came out in 68. But I came out for the revolution, um, to work at the digital revolution, to work at the early Wired magazine. And Wired was definitely part of the legacy that we're going to be exploring here, coming off the whole earth. And then I worked at Global Business Network, uh, GBN, uh, which is a company that basically Stuart Brand helped co-found uh, with his other founders. And um, that's definitely part of the legacy, the direct legacy coming right off of Stuart himself there. And one of the things I learned about St from Stuart was essentially the importance, the value of networks, and how to connect up different innovators from different fields and bring them together to really drive innovation. In fact, it's really the only thing that really does drive, in many respects, really fundamentally new innovations, bringing the smart, innovative folks together and just get them focused on challenges. And so our company, reInvent, that's what we do. We build out networks, we bring them together and focus them on different challenges, and we've built this network here uh, with Cap Gemini's help here for the what's now here. Uh, but the other thing is, coming in my media background, we also video this. We get it out to the world. It shouldn't be help just kept behind closed doors here. And so we got a three camera shoot here. You can always get it off the live stream here if you want off our front page. And also if you're doing social media, use that hashtag. Uh, let's get these ideas out there. These are the kind of things that folks uh, can use far and wide here. Now 50 years ago, this weird kind of Whole Earth Catalog, which is a combination magazine, how-to book, tools catalog, suddenly kind of appeared on the scene with this picture of the whole Earth scene from space, which had never really been seen up to, from, by most people at that point. Uh, and it really immediately made an impact on many different people, and many of them are actually in this room here today. And in fact, what it kind of started to do was to catalyze a network of people scattered all over the place that kind of bought into a different kind of worldview, a worldview that was very distinct from what was the kind of contemporary version, what was going on in the 60s, coming off the Great War in the 50s and the 60s. And it's now with 50 years perspective, I think we can really look back and say, what did that really represent? And what is the legacy that really has kind of come off that? And in some ways, if you step back, you know, it really was a kind of a different kind of worldview. It was a more of a, what I would think of as a, what we now know as a 21st century worldview compared to a very 20th century worldview. It was, by definition, global. I mean, symbolized by that world on the cover like that. But it was ecological. It was kind of pointing towards what we now understand as sustainability. Uh, it was decentralized compared to kind of the centralized kind of function of what was going on in the, in the world there. It was, uh, it was also about... It was, a, but it was technology. It was into tools and technology. It was pro tech. It was about personalizing technology, decentralizing, personalizing technologies. It also had a kind of biological view, kind of lens on the world, as opposed to the kind of mechanistic, mechanical version that was dominant in the 20th century. And it was optimistic and can do, which was kind of countering the pessimism of that period right then. And so, in many respects, it's that worldview that we're kind of starting to kind of see now for a little bit differently than what it, when it was kind of messy and emerging at the time. The other thing is it spawned all kinds of different things off of it. And what we're going to talk about today is kind of what we think of as the legacy of the Whole Earth Catalog. In some respects, there was an intellectual legacy, which is the ideas that people adapted and ran with in their own kind of works and projects. And then there's a kind of, I would call it an entrepreneurial legacy, which was all kinds of organizations and businesses uh, and things that I actually built off it as well. And famously, Steve Jobs, um, you know, was talked about how being inspired by the whole earth, really him was one of the driving forces behind him and uh, Apple Computer. And so we're going to talk about the legacy of all kinds of things coming off that. Now, um, we're going to start out by having uh, Stuart come up here, and um, he and I are going to have a little conversation laying out what he sees as the legacy, kind of coming his own kind of immediate legacy, but legacy that was kind of radiated off of that and other kind of folks. But we're going to do something different here. In the spirit of experimentation, we're what's now. We're going to have, we have about a dozen folks 
that are in their own ways remarkable people that have actually been touched by the whole earth in their own ways and they're going to talk a little bit in a very short little three-minute burst about the legacy in their fields. Uh, and we're going to see how that's going to go, kind of make, see if we can really keep disciplined on that little burst. And then we're going to roll into conversation with all you, which is our way of doing this all the time. Another twist here that you want to know is that we actually have a documentary film crew here. It's Structure Films. They are doing, they're the folks that did Bill Nye the Science Guy, a feature length film that was been in theaters and also on television. They're actually doing one on Stuart now. And so you're going to see, the, there's one of them shooting here. They're going to have folks running around here. So besides my team doing this in live stream, they're basically going to be capturing another way. And we're going to actually have a room in the back here. When all of us, after this, start eating and drinking with the food trucks that are going to be coming here. Uh, we're going to be pulling people into side interviews for these, again, these three-minute bursts on what the whole earth meant to you and how it has impacted your field. So with all that, we've got a great evening here. Let's get Stuart up here to start the conversation. Stuart. Before we start, how's the sound? Are we good? Mark LeBrun, are you here? I hear you have an original Whole Earth catalog. Can we borrow it for a few minutes? As long as you give it back. <laughs> well, no kidding. Do you realize how rare these are? This may be the fifth one in existence that we know about. We just learned about tonight. There's only five? It's insanely valuable. But I've got a price. <laughs> <laughs> the price is you have to autograph it. He's saying it's a price. That. He's got to okay. Stuart's got to autograph it, which he will. I will do that later. Is that all right? Okay. <laughs> I promise. All right. Anyway. There this it is. This is a rare thing. Folks, five in the world exist right now that we know. It's a rare thing because there are only a thousand printed. They're printed on newsprint. I'm amazed it's as well preserved as it is. I think Lloyd Kahn has one that's just in tatters. So 50 years of newsprint is, uh, gets old fast. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, Stuart, I mean, for those that don't I mean, know the story, uh, mm -hmm. tell us about how did you get that picture of Earth from space, and did at the time, though, reflecting back, did you expect it to make the impact it did? I mean, were you actually so focused on it to actually, because you knew it'd be something bigger, or were you surprised by what happened with that? One notion fades into another, and uh, after the Trish Festival in January 1966, in March of 1966, over here in North Beach, I had this notion that, uh, probably 100 micrograms of LSD, I had the notion, <laughs> that seeing a photograph of Earth from space would be a big deal. And because it had been 10 years since we'd been in space with Sputnik at that point, which went up in 56, it seemed odd that such a photograph had not been made. So I've made this paranoid button saying, why haven't we seen a photograph of the whole Earth yet? And sent it to everybody, Buckminster Fuller and Marshall McLuhan and senators and members of the Politburo and everybody. <laughs> and by 68, there were these first ATS sort of weather type satellites from synchronous orbit uh, that were video images basically, but pretty good. And that's what I used on the original Whole Earth catalog. Later in, um, I guess it was the end of 68, we got the Earthrise type photographs from basically homesick astronauts. Humans carrying a camera going, oh my God, look at that, taking the Earthrise photograph and so on. That's what started to have the emotional impact that uh, I thought of back on LSD would happen. And, uh, <laughs> so you did intuit that it was going to be a big deal. That's good. Yeah. Oh, that's good. And, you know, it was a sort of, a, I, I was going to make this catalog of tools. And uh, one day Dick Raymond, who was the mentor and umbrella of this whole thing, just leaned in and said, what are you going to call this thing? I, mean, I don't know, whole, whole Earth catalog, what the hell? And that was that. So in a similar way, looking back on, uh, to what extent, what, what was motivating you to actually create the Whole Earth Catalog? And again, looking back on it, did you see it as a way to catalyze a different kind of worldview that wasn't kind of being represented out there? Or is that just with retrospect, you can kind of see the distinctions? The most interesting thing going on with my generation then, for me, was not the new left, which I'd hung out with and done a little work with, which went nowhere. Um, but with communes like Lama in New Mexico and Drop City in Colorado and some that were going, starting around here. And there was a sense of uh, things are sort of going so well, 50s, early 60s, but there's disturbance going on. By 68, we're getting a couple of assassinations. Civil rights movement is 
uh, in full swing. Vietnam is getting weird. And um, I thought the people who were doing the communes had this notion of sort of starting over. There was a lot of language about back to basics. And it was, it was kind of a reboot. And they were thinking at kind of the civilizational level. Let's just reboot civilization, get it right this time. Ha. Uh, <laughs> one, that's hard. Two, they all failed. Uh, the communes dried up within a few years in most cases, though everybody learned lots, which they applied through the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. But by focusing on my ignorance and our ignorance as people trying to reinvent civilization, we didn't know how to really build a dome until Lloyd Kahn showed us. We didn't really know how to garden until we listened to Robert Rodale and, and the people doing organic gardening. Uh, we didn't know how to do uh, lots of things. And that how to do, I had learned from Buckminster Fuller, was the fundamental thing to have. And so access to tools was the real operational tagline for the whole operation. Got you. Now, um, actually, just one thing I just want to know. Can people see in the back? Do we need another set of lights up here? We could, uh, is it good for the cameras? Now? We could often have, we're good without the lights here? OK. Just want to make sure and we're good. Um, now you and I are talking beforehand here. We're talking about, you mentioned Gregor Bateson's kind of idea mm -hmm. that, you know, what are the differences that make a difference? And mm -hmm. I'm curious when you look back on the whole earth and you do think about the worldview that was kind of represented in it, what, what was different about it? What were the things that struck you at the time or even looking, what struck you now looking back on? The kind of what, what was distinct from the prevailing thinking at the time? I think there's two things to say about that. Remind me if I don't, that I said there would be two. Um, you keep mentioning legacy and we've talked about consequence and influence and stuff like that and there's many people here sort of interested in how this downstream phenomenon plays out and I mentioned the idea of a consequence tree and then immediately realized that's a desperately stupid metaphor um, people talk about dropping the pond in the, or the pebble in the pond and the ripples go out and it's sort of poetic but doesn't tell you anything. Um, it's more like it's, it's a river, it's not a pond, river time. And you drop something into it, and it's not a log, it's a, something alive, call it a fish. We're going deep into metaphor here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a pregnant fish. <laughs> <laughs> and the fish hits the water and does its fishy thing, and because it's pregnant, uh, causes other fishes to be born. But because this particular fish is both different and focused on being kind of innovative and trying things, it creates other fishes that have those qualities of being different from the parent fish, different in relation to the other fish that are already in the river, but trying to blend into the actual river that's there. <laughs> and they're all pregnant, it turns out. <laughs> they have more fish, and so there's a branching, uh, you know, in evolutionary terms, this is a really kind of Cambrian explosion of lots of different things to get tried just because some kind of idea that trying stuff is fun to do gets loose. So the second thing then is, I'm trying to figure out, you know, what did, I hear from various people the Whole Earth Catalog changed my life. I did this because of the Whole Earth Catalog. Various things happened because of the Whole Earth Catalog. But when you look at, and, and uh, because we're doing an event on October uh, 13th that I'll talk about, we've been getting feedback from people who want to go to that event. Ryan Phelan, my wife right there, put the question to them, uh, how did the Whole Earth affect your life? And she got back all these answers. And one of the real common themes is what you might call agency that the whole earth catalog was such an easy perusal of lots of things that offered skills and tools to do stuff with, to try stuff with, that it invited people to just go ahead and try stuff that hadn't even occurred to them before to try or to realize how easy it was to get into doing these things. So this conferring of agency, I think, is the main event that the catalog set going, though I could certainly not say it was the major intention. The major intention was just kind of how to and, and 
we stayed away from Y2. There were no politics, there was no religion, and uh, there was very little art. It was all kind of engineering type solutions to uh, fixing things or creating new things. And it turns out when you offer that to people, they grab and run and they become pregnant fish. Mm. <laughs> do you think, um, I totally get that, but just to push one You even do? Th- I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, maybe I don't totally get that, but I kind of get that. Um, but do you think it was connecting up the, the people drawn, or let's say the fish that respond, or however you want to think about this? Um, were they thinking differently? Did they have a different worldview? Was it different than what was kind of prevalent at the time? And has that grown in in the legacy period here? I mean, again, some of the things I was saying at the beginning there that it was a kind of decentralized, it was more biological, it was more global, it was ecological. I mean, there's all these things. Is, is that make sense to you, or would you kind of straighten me out on that? Well, there's a lot of framing that goes with it. So ideas are coming from Buckminster Fuller, so there's a lot of Fullerness in there. There's a whole page of Buckminster Fuller in the first one. Um, there's a lot of hippiness. That's the generation that was going on, and I was just slightly older than. I was part of the bridge uh, between the beatniks, basically, and the hippies, and we were consciously sort of doing that. And, and then it's an intensely Bay Area. And so it was self-published, but the Bay Area had been a hotbed of self-publishing for a long time. So, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants, standing on the fins of a lot of pregnant fish. We just no, discovered... Really, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, that metaphor is now retired. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, so... So your own lineage, the, the direct lineage mm-hmm. from the whole earth, which kind of lives through you, the various organizations you were involved with, mm-hmm. um, how would you tell that story? If you had to kind of tell the story be, that connects up what you've done since, is there, an, is there an arc to that? Is there a way that you connect them all as one kind of giant story that's all kind of just started there and kept going, or was it... I'm glancing over at John Markov because it's his job <laughs> 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 to figure this out. Um, he's doing a biography. And, and we'll be hearing a little bit from him later. Good, and the film guys are going to have their own interpretation of, is there any linkage? The, um, I think conferring agency is, is a thing that keeps emerging. Um, I had been an army officer, so one, I had no qualms about that anything I was involved in, that somebody was in charge. Uh, lots of hippies had a lot of problems with that. But I, what I knew was nothing gets done <laughs> under those circumstances. So it's helpful to have somebody in charge. It doesn't matter who so much. And that maybe because I was trained as an officer, the whole deal on an officer is you do not do the work. <laughs> <laughs> Sergeants do the work. <laughs> They're very, very good at it. And if you get in their way, you're a bad officer. But what you're doing is understanding that there's a sense that stuff gets done, and, and this was escaping from being a writer, you know, and also it's an escape from being an introvert. Uh, you gotta get other people involved. And then basically put a bunch, standard mode, I did this with the Trips Festival with Keezy and the Franksters and so on, is you put a lot of interesting people Here's a new metaphor, in a pot. Maybe it's a hot tub. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, if the, say their ingredients. This, I'm, they're not going to be pregnant fish this time, I promise you, because I'm going to turn up the heat. <laughs> and that is a way, and, and, and there's a boundary to it, there's a direction to it, there's a focus to it, and then stuff gets going. Mm. And what you're trying to do, and this is Gregory Bateson's terminology, you're basically trying to make circuit with the world. And uh, this is the minimum viable product from software developers, that you, know, you just get something rudimentary enough but useful enough going that it starts to take on a life of its own. And then you're working for that life. It's very clear what you're doing. Otherwise, you're just having opinions. So when you think, and we're going to hear from other people later, but you know, you were involved in founding of the well. You were mm-hmm. kind of entangled, although not really a founder, but of Wired. You were a founder of Global Business Network. You are a founder of Revive and Restore, and you mm-hmm. are known now most prominently as a founder 
of long now. So, mm -hmm. I mean, various people here probably have tracked that, and there's some that might not know, but do you see a, like, a, like, oh, that's just the direct concept. Oh, that was the whole earth. Of course, I had to go online. I have to go on the, on the well. Oh, from the well, I definitely, we, will need, uh, we were globalization. I should have, I need to mm -hmm. focus on Global Business Network. Or, I mean, did you have any kind of way of just, it was your march of just the consequences off of the whole earth? Or was it just more, that was what was interesting you at the time? Well, in, in a sense, it's one whim after another. One whim um, after another. And one sort of noticing an opportunity or a problem that might be solved after another. And then you're just looking at sort of what's the, the train of focus of the noticer that is doing those things. By the way, notice that in each of those cases you said a founder. <laughs> Or, or <laughs> and so it's important that, except for maybe the whole Earth catalog, I was always a co-founder, and that's another part of this, you know, spreading the life of the thing the, and the juice of the thing and the work, for sure, of the thing. I was trained as an officer to be lazy. Um, mm -hmm. So one thing does lead to another. A, 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 because of the whole Earth catalog, and then I was at TED, and I met Nicholas Negropati, and then he invited me to come to the Media Lab uh, in 87 or so, and uh, GBN was just starting to crank up about the Global Business Network was starting to crank up, and uh, I realized that I needed to do a book at the, about the Media Lab. There was so much news there. I'd never done an actual book before. But the Media Lab is in this... Uh, extremely expensive, I am pay, very fancy building, uh, which not only does not function, but cannot function. It is designed to look amazing in the magazine uh, in an I am pay's reputation, but it is a, a just a functional building, whereas just down the street was a set of temporary buildings from World War II, it was the Rad Lab in World War II called Building 20, that everybody adored because you could do anything you wanted in there. And how much money did the you know, alumni put up for this bad, gaudy building that didn't work versus basically no money for this wooden rad lab buildings? And I realized that something was deeply broken in architecture. And then th the way these whims work is, so the Media Lab project, Media Lab book in that sense read, led to the book called How Buildings Learn. And in each case, what I'm doing, if you know, I think everybody does this. You sort of see a problem and you think, okay, what's a potential way to fix it? And uh, with the whole Earth Catalog, I was fixing the ignorance of my fellow commune people. Uh, with the with, uh, How Buildings Learn book, I was not going to become an architecture and fix architecture from within. But I could bear down for seven years of research and come up with a book that sort of just spelled out how buildings work best in the world and undermine the whole traditions of architecture in one fell swoop. So there, the, the solution was a book. So, you know, you develop skills over time and you see problems and you apply the skills that either you have or that you can convince some other people to bear down on it and that's how it plays out. I don't think that answers your sense of what's the art at all. Do we just go dark? <laughs> we got, oh no, we By the way, I hear go. you're live streaming, right? Yeah. Do we know how many people are live streaming? We don't right now, but we could probably figure that out. Or right they're now. dead streaming now. But usually, uh, uh oh, now they've been. They've um, no, that's just, that's not the mic. That's just the backdrop. Um, okay. Well, let's let's see. We're gonna sketch out a couple of things here now. So there is your lineage, direct mm -hmm. lineage, and then there's this kind of secondary lineage off of you. Mm -hmm. And when you think of the kind of legacy of the whole earth, you know, the environmental movement, you know, <laughs> California politics, hackers, makers, I mean, there's a lot of people that can refer back to that times. Do you, do you see it that way? I mean, do you, do you have a way of kind of talking about the kind of legacy that was kind of not, you weren't directly involved with, but you just were kind of spectating and watching as you kind of flowed down the stream there? Or how do you think about that? Uh, Fuller was right. Tools are the most powerful thing you can unleash in the world. It's one of the reasons I, th I think I've stayed with technology, and that probably is one of these common themes you'll see through here. Is there a technological workaround? Because Fuller's line was um, a lot of people want to change human behavior, you know, just behave better and all will be well. 
and changing human behavior is proven over the many millennia, basically impossible. It's, it's you know, you got what you got. But you can change tools very easily. You just invent a tool or invent a material or put a new material together and do a new use, and that's a new tool. And uh, likewise with skills, and the tools and the skills feed off each other, and then people who are using them in the world, the world feeds into that, and you get this proliferation of capability that goes. And so in the back of the whole Earth catalog, for example, in the sort of total transparency mode, we had a couple of pages on how we made the whole Earth catalog, the actual you know, IBM Selectric Composer, how you use that, and how much it cost, and uh, how much it, you know, unit cost of put, making so many, and how if you make more, the lower unit cost. It's really fundamental stuff. And by the way, hippies were discovering at that time that the first part of American society that accepted them with their colorful clothing and long hair and weird behavior uh, were business people. Business people really did not care how you dress so long as you um, paid your bills <laughs> uh, and were you know, good to deal with as customers and as vendors and as co-creators and so on. So a whole lot of the hippies, many of whom learned business from being dope dealers, <laughs> which is not a bad place to learn business, by the way. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, supply, yes. demand, yep. don't fuck over your vendors. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you start to get dishonest in that game, things get ugly very fast. So, um, a whole cadre of honest, earnest, young business people emerged from that period. And so, you know, that things like Wired and so on would take off uh, as good commercial enterprises is, is not surprising because the, those tools can be applied very well and there, and there was a, a readiness there in small business to just um, absorb this kind of creativity and, and make it into something real in the world. Were you surprised? I mean, again, people claiming roots in the legacy. I mean, you could argue that organic farming folks kind of look back to that. But on the other hand, it would come to my chagrin. To your chagrin, exactly. And th but that would there's another legacy of you know genetically engineered crops or something that would <laughs> clash with it, even though they're kind of both rooted in a tools different you know different kind of mentality. Different tools, yeah. Did did it ever kind of frustrate you that you saw these different strands clashing or going off? kind of rogue and, and not really, well, there's or no that's just part of what, the, what has to happen off of the big ideas. For sure there's no sense of ownership and should not be. I think when people try to own an idea or a name or whatever, um, that helps kill it. So one of the things we did with just the term whole earth was say anybody wants to call anything whole earth, fine, that's just two words, go ahead and use them. Don't call it whole earth catalog because it might be kind of confusing both for your customers and ours. But uh, apart from that, you know, just go ahead on. And so this was Diderot's encyclopedia. This was what he brought with the Enlightenment. The idea of making all the hidden skills become unhidden and all the hard to get tools easy to get. And you know, lowering the cost, lowering the ability. Access was as important a word as, as tools was. Um, and and then and the other, you know, the, it's a line attributed to Harry Truman, there's no limit to the amount of things you get done in the world so long as you don't try to take credit. Hmm, that's a good, so just kind of keep it going. You absolutely hand it off. And that's not being modest, that's being realistic. It is, when people grab something you've pointed at and they run with it in their own direction, it's not yours anymore in any respect. They may be vaguely grateful back in your direction, but that doesn't matter. The matter is that something alive is now out in the world trying things. Well, that out in the alive, so that's just a few more questions. Like, it, it particularly resonated here in the Bay Area, as you pointed out. Mm -hmm. And I would say even more broadly, it's, it's, there's a kind of a Californian kind of worldview or kind of mm -hmm. thing that it's kind of emerged out of that last 50 years of the Whole Earth Catalog. I mean, do you see... It was going on before the catalog came along. That's true. Okay, well, that's, yeah. that's, that's a good way to think of it. I mean, do you, so, but you kind of helped catalyze it or at least kind of kept 
spreading it. How do you think of yourself in that legacy? Because there's something special about the Bay Area, something about the California that really is kind of more tuned into this mindset and more kind of ready to run with it. Well, a theory I've stated before is that if you want to be successful in life, you go to New York, or you go to Los Angeles, or you go to Washington, D.C. now, and if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere, and so on. People will go to San Francisco, or at least they didn't used to, in order to succeed. They came here to be happy. <laughs> hey, there's the ocean, there's the mountains, there's <laughs> drugs, there's uh, you know artists who uh, like to collaborate, there's Burning Man now, there's... Of course you would come to the Bay Area to you know, just hang and uh, encounter other interesting creative people. And the first thing you know, you've started three businesses and three months after that, you're a unicorn. But <laughs> <laughs> that versions of that have been going on for a long time, uh, certainly long before I got here. One interesting difference of now and then is that then there was no money and now there's uh, you know, insane amounts of money. There's Bitcoin millionaires wandering around that aren't 20 yet, and there's unicorns that aren't 30 yet, like uh, Patrick and John Collison. And uh, they're having to discover the kind of, I mean, the bohemians and then the hippies that I was hanging with, our creativity was focused on how much amazing stuff you can do and be on almost no money. And these folks are having to make that a similar discovery on how do you not get just driven mad by quite a lot of money. And you know, that's a problem that is not entirely solved yet, but it's a very interesting one. And it's one as affluence is building throughout the world, that in a sense we're sort of a test bed for what do you do with quite a lot of affluence and not get screwed up by it and be useful to the world with it. That's an interesting set of problems we have now. But it's it very is. similar to the ones of having no money. That's very interesting. Um, do you think there's something that California or even the Bay Area has to teach the rest of America or the rest of the world, at particularly at this juncture where people are confused on how to go forward or how to make things work? Do you think we have a special responsibility here in any way? I think our special responsibility is to keep the East Coast disconcerted. <laughs> <laughs> seems to resonate, seems to resonate. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> All right. When I think about you, I think of you as a civilizational thinker. Mm -hmm. I mean, here you're long now, it's thinking in 10,000 year sweeps, but really your whole life that I've tracked, you think long term, you think about things that really are important, that really matter, that move on a different time frame and that are really interested in kind of what I would say are at, a, at a civilizational pace at some mm -hmm. level. To what extent do you think, with a long view, that some of the things that even the whole Earth kind of catalyzed and many of the things that have spawned after that is moving towards what will be seen as kind of a different civilizational kind of perspective in this century? I mean, this whole biological perspective, this whole sustainable stuff. Pete, any, you, any? Pete you've got a theory here, and I want to hear it. No, no, no. Okay. no, no come on. Out with it. I'll, I'll, see, if I, I'll see if I agree. I think, okay, you want to hear my theory? <laughs> I'm try, I was trying to get him to say this, but... Uh, I know you were. <laughs> to me, what the whole earth and its derivatives represented was essentially a break from 20th century hierarchical, centralized, national kind of thinking. I mean, all kinds of things that were very 20th century or kind mm -hmm. of industrial agey and all kinds of different metaphors we've learned about. Mm -hmm. But it was the seeds of something that I would think of as more 21st century, uh, mm -hmm. decentralized, uh, high tech in different ways, more biological than mechanical. I was kind of laying it out in the beginning here. Um, holistic, long term, um, um, global. I mean, it, it, there's a lot of mental shifts that started in a kind of a nascent way back then that have kind of picked up steam since, have still a ways to go, but I think with time might be seen as distinct, very clearly distinct from essentially the kind of the civilization we've been operating with post-enlightenment into the kind of industrial era into the late 20th century. I mean, I don't know, maybe that, that's where I was trying to push you, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I don't know, do you see something like that? You're thinking in the big lens of time. I'm just thinking, do you have any sense that that's something that we're witnessing or all participating in in some weird way here? Yeah, there's big, big deep shifts going on and I think have been going on for quite a while and may be accelerating. Um, 
and whether there's some kind of S-curve where the pace of change is going to somehow level off, I don't really know because the things that you're measuring themselves change and there's not a, a single metric. Population is in the process of leveling off. There are a bunch of things that happen. And so the hippies were the, in the US, the demographic pig in the python. We, we, you know, we were the, the large number, of, a cadre of very large number of people. And we were, the hippies were exactly as witless as everybody else who was in their late teens and early 20s. But because there were so many of us, there was this national attention being paid to us. All the advertisers are trying to figure out what we're wearing and what we're thinking and what do you think about this and how about national politics and oh yeah, we got opinions. Hey, we'll call a press conference. And people would come. <laughs> but it was just a demographic blip. And, and so, you know, you could, I think, I mean, as we say in the, in the scenario business, demographics is destiny. And basically, if you got the numbers of where people are, where they're moving, when they're born, how many are born, how many are dying, the rate of their dying, once you've got that, you've got most of what's actually going on in the world. So I think a lot of that phenomenon was just this demographic blip of a number of people at a certain age, at a certain time, uh, doing things. Other nations are having, I think is, um, is still accelerating. And so we'll look back on the last 50 years as sort of like on the last 10,000 years of climate. Of wasn't that a wonderfully predictable time? Mm. The last 50 years. <laughs> the last 50 years, yeah. Compared the, to the coming yeah, the, the 50, thing coming, that you, Yeah, the thing that you're talking about is this huge shift. Uh, may be seen as the last stable period. God, that was a golden age. <laughs> you know, the, the world was sort of recognizable from year to year. Um, and that may go away. Hmm. Interesting. So I, I, I think there is, yeah, a phase shift, but not the first and not the last. But pretty fundamental. I mean, the world's going digital, it's going global, it's got to go sustainable. These are fundamental, we're on the cusp of, you know, genetic engineering and, you know, Biotech is coming all on. kinds of things that are like, you know, isn't that almost civilizational retooling on a pretty fundamental level, like how things work in that world? Yeah, and uh, you know, just the self-awareness of civilization is something that uh, is, I think, new uh, at the global scale. And the photographs of Earth from space and Rusty going in orbit around it and all of that is and more people soon going in orbit around it having a sense of that we are lots of nations but one life and one species so far more to come humans I mean homo sapiens so there'll be you know other sapiens and but that and then fantastically just in time we have a climate change problem that is caused by everybody in the world and can only be solved by basically everybody in the world deciding, you know, how are we going to work this so the greenhouse gases come back down and so we can have a stable climate again. And it becomes a civilizational scale problem set that, gets, that can't be dealt with in any given decade. It's at least a century scale problem. So civilization, this is kind of a, you know, growing out of adolescence as near as I can tell, going on in this, you know, you're so lucky to be born in this century because this is the century when civilization figures out how to fix planet-scale problems that it has caused. And this isn't like the Cold War that basically got solved by uh, you know, a, a few hidden laboratories and uh, sets of scientists and sets of policymakers and diplomats behind the scenes. It was you know, a few score of people that saved the world from the nuclear problem. Uh, this has got to be, in one sense or another, everybody. So, aren't we lucky to be alive now? Wonderfully said. All right, well, just to wrap up this segment here. And then I'm going to say something. Then wrap okay, it. okay. Um, are you happy about the legacy so far? I was thinking about this. I mean, oh, God. That's interesting. when you look back on the last 50 years, is this something you feel good about, proud about, surprised about? Um, I've had my problems with the environmental movement that I got to be part of giving shape in the, in the uh, late 60s and early 70s. And, and apart from Fred Turner's wonderful book, From Counterculture to Cyberculture, there's another book called 
uh, Counterculture Green by Andrew Kirk, and it's basically looking at a kind of pragmatic string of environmentalism that the whole Earth Catalog and Coevolution Quarterly with his biological name and so on pervade, and people like Peter Warshaw. And um, there was enough of a leftover new left and leftover romantic hippie thing that the environmental movement um, wound up focusing on the sort of one with nature aspect of things rather than how do you solve the damn problem. And that led to being anti-GMO in agriculture, which was counterproductive as far as I'm concerned with the environment. Uh, organic is great and proud to have been part of what brought that into popular culture. But uh, hard over sort of religious level organics has been described correctly by one uh, genetic engineer as uh, the largest mo marketing hoax in history. Uh, you know, how much extra will people pay when you put the words organic on uh, sugar or whatever it is. So that's the only dismay I've had, and my way to solve that problem is to write this book, Whole Earth Discipline. Got you. Final thing is you're known as an optimist, and um, you are an optimist. I've been around you many years here. But I'm wondering, <laughs> are you optimistic about the next 50 years here? We've looked... If you look ahead of the next 50 years, see how the legacy might play out and other things play out. Uh, how are you? Are you feeling optimistic about what we're heading into here? Yeah, and, and I, I am. Um, I think this is the greenest century ever. I think we're playing of creativity in the world and awareness of, of each other in issues and issues and stepping right up to them. So I'm, I'm really happy about our situation in that respect. Now, uh, people like Ryan Phelan makes me realize uh, she can always instantly see how something can go wrong with something. And she desi designs <laughs> the things she does around basically worst case scenarios. And she and Jeff Bezos are the fastest people to catch on to what could go wrong with a swell idea that you just came up with that I know. And as a consequence, uh, she's much more successful at driving things through those dark expectations than me, the cockeyed optimist, oh, everything's going to be fine, just relax. <laughs> well, you know, that actually works sometimes, <laughs> but most of the time, and this is why you want a mix of people involved. If you're doing any kind of thing in the world, have at least a few optimists around and have a few realistic ones and a few realistic pessimists who can say, here's the various ways that we're, what we're trying to do can go wrong. How do we head them off? I and mean, this is just basic programming, seeing where the program is about to go astray, and then you know, designing the thing that will realize that's happening and, and build backwards. Um, I want to say a little bit yeah. about uh, that this is kind of a lead-in event yes, for uh, a subsequent that. event in October, October 13th. Um, Ryan and Danica Remy and a whole bunch of other people, the steering committee, Kevin Kelly, Peter Schwartz and others are assembling what will be a thing called the Whole Earth 50th. Oops, and we're taking over Pier 2 at uh, Fort Mason. We got it up here too. There you go, outstanding. Uh, it's a Saturday. Uh, and taking over Pier 2 means we not only get where the San Francisco Art Institute is with this wonderful space in there, which they're renting to us at a low rate, we get Cowell Theater at the end. So there's going to be a kind of a private gathering of all of the hundreds of people that have made all of the various whole earth phenomena happen. The Hackers Conference, the, uh, the Well, the, the Coevolution Quarterly Whole Earth Review, 30 years basically of stuff that was under the, the Point Foundation and Whole Earth Rubric. That's a lot of people and it's a chance for them basically to take a bow and to have a kind of a you know, class meeting, these various cohorts of people uh, to hang out together. I would love to spend time again with, you know, Andrea Sharp and Evelyn Eldridge and various people over that I got to work with back in the day. Uh, because, you know, while we were doing that hard work, we were family. And Douglas Copeland is right. It's an air family. You're, you, know, you know each other better than you do. Um, your blood family. So that part is reunion. There's a public part 
that'll be going on in the Call Theater in the evening. So all afternoon, the public, the private group will be meeting. We'll be having, you know, foo camp type gatherings around various subjects that'll come up. There might be some kind of featured speakers on a bit of a stage, and we'll live stream that. And then in the evening from um, seven until nine. Uh, there's a public gathering uh, that's ticketed and uh, there'll be various levels of how you can see that, including by live streaming. And that will have, Ryan's idea I think is a good one, it will get people from the past talking to people of the present and the future. And uh, so we might have Howard Reingold talking about the well and somebody, maybe you know, Cheryl Sandberg or someone like that from Facebook uh, talking about you know, how do you do community online? What are the issues that are the same and what are the issues that are different? Um, I just heard today from the, the maker movement is one of the most wonderful things to come out of this period of time. And the Holy Catalog may have had a, a hand in that. Neil Gershenfeld, who's been at MIT Media Lab, is one of the ultimate makers with his fab labs. There are several hundred of them around the world now. Uh, I just got an email from him today saying uh, he wants to come into this thing and show he's made a machine that makes the machines that makes the machines that makes the machines that makes the machines, that makes the machines and demo that. So we hope people will bring things to uh, show and tell about. Uh, there'll be you know, nostalgic stuff. Yeah, bring your t-shirt, bring your original Holy catalog. We'll have a kind of exhibit of historical stuff. And the idea is there'll be the, the stage where there's the, the past talking to the future and then at the end of that, 9 o'clock, then the, the two crowds blend and they all come together and hang out and exhibit and all this sort of stuff. Um, Ryan wants me to point out that uh, this is not cheap and so <laughs> to, to do it at this level. And so we are looking for sponsors. And uh, Danica Remy right here will raise her hand. We'll talk to anyone who would like to help sponsor this event. Uh, or has ideas who might like to help sponsor this event. It'll cost over 100000 to do it right. We probably need to fly in some of the people that we would like to have presenting in the evening. Does that kind of cover the event, you guys? <laughs> Great. We got it. All right. Okay. End of well, I'll tell you what. Now we're going to segue to the next section here. Actually, let's give little Stuart a hand for some of those thoughts here. <laughs> Now, instead of having Stuart pressed on the legacy in more specific ways, um, we've actually reached out to a dozen folks who are going to give a brief three minute, we're giving you an extra second, by the way, three <laughs> minutes to, do, to actually reflect on three things. One of they first get impacted by the Whole Earth Catalog or Stuart Grand, meaning the legacy that came off the Whole Earth. How has the Whole Earth Catalog and Stuart influenced your field or fields in the last 50 years? And do you think the legacy might carry on? How do you think it might carry on in the future? Now, Kevin Kelly, who's going to go to be the first one, astutely pointed out that no one's going to be able to do this in all in three minutes very well. So you can choose one of, the two, one of them, or you can choose the top two. But anyhow, folks have actually had a little time to think about this. And, and, um, and Kevin is going to lead off, and we're going to basically start, and we're going to go around here. And we're, because it's just, the, the reason for this is to get you to realize, as Stuart said, when you kind of, initiate something like this, people run with it, and they run with it in very, very interesting ways. So, uh, Kevin, do you want to kind of start it off with your three-minute thing? You can see the timer there, you can see it here, and uh, the others actually will be going right after that. So, uh, go ahead. So, yes. So, um, my topic, I have, oh, I have one minute left. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> Is a lot. I think that um, for me, as Stuart suggested, the overwhelming um, uh, uh, aha that I got from the whole catalog was this agency permission to do anything that I could imagine. But more importantly, um, it was the subtext, the subtitle of access to tools. And what it, what it did for me, and I think carried on into the future and through Wired and beyond, was uh, it was a catalog of possibilities that I had no idea could exist. And it's very hard for anybody who is not as old as I am to realize how limited knowledge about what you could do was back in, say, the 1960s. There was no internet. Bookstores were usually local and very, very parochial. Libraries even were very hard to use in anything that was current. And so 
the internet in many ways, I mean, the Haworth catalog was the internet. The same kind of feeling that you would have now about that abundance of possibilities that you get online, that was what the catalog brought forward. And so if you read the catalog, some of the longer posts are like blog posts. It's the same sensibility. It's, it's enthusiastic, in, informed knowledge about something that is being shared. And so for me, the emphasis on tools was the eye-opener. It was this idea of approaching the world through the view of technology and tools and the liberation and the humanizing that tools could bring. And that, I think, um, it didn't have to go that way. I mean, I think the early 60s and 50s, there was the beginning of a kind of an anti-technological feeling that this stuff was steamrolling us, was overwhelming us, and it could have gone in a different direction. The attitude about technology could have kind of um, frozen into uh, an anti-technological view. But I think the Whole Earth Catalog's embrace of the personal benefits of tools and technology helped swing it in a direction that we're now in, in which we can understand that this, these things bring us possibilities. That's what we get, despite the many problems that technology brings, and the many benefits, what we get out of the net gain is we get increasing options and possibilities. And that, I think, is what traveled through WIRE. And I think that's present for a lot of the Silicon Valley today. This sense that this is not, ant technology and tools aren't anti-human, aren't anti-community, aren't anti-us. They are actually make us better. And I think a lot of that comes back to access to tools in the Whole Earth Catalog. Wow, <laughs> impressive. <laughs> Hit it on the nose. Um, Larry Brilliant, are you ready? You got your mic. You can stand, you can stand right there if you want to just do it. Yeah, you can stand. Or you can come up. You can come up. Okay, you can't start the time until I sit down. <laughs> I want to see everybody. Hello. And you can see you can see the timer up there too. Can All I right? see the hands of anybody who used the well? <laughs> you had accounts. Thank you, Larry. All right. What was your name on the well? Wrangler. Yell it out. Yell it out. St Stuart. Stuart. Your 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 pregnant fish laid eggs, <laughs> <laughs> and they're squirming. And the the well was one of your legacies. Uh, whole Earth Electronic Link. But the image was from the I Ching of the well in the center of a village, that sense of community that came from sharing water together. And the well was everything, Cheryl and Zuck, forgive me, that Facebook is not, that Twitter is not. In fact, I went back in the only preparation that I did for this, is I looked at the current well, which is still alive 40 years later. How many of you still get your email at a well address? I'm Larry at well.com. I still get email there. And if you look at the founding principles, Stuart, the, the well was a piece of technology, but it was a vision and a dream. And Stuart did some things that were counterintuitive. They were against every business school principle. Number one, when you get on the well and you look at it today, it talks about the decency of community, the trust that you can have in your neighbors, and it says, we will not accept advertising. You paid $8 a month and $2 an hour. I wanted it the other way. Stewart said, no, you want people to use the damn thing, so you make it cheap to use. <laughs> and then he said, and they'll forget they're paying $8 a day, and 20 years later, you'll still be getting that money. And then he said, you own your own words. One of the most important things that, in my experience of the history of networking, you own your own words. And he had parties, so people got to know each other face to face. And I would say that part of the problem that we have with technology today is that it doesn't go back to the well, the wellspring and its roots that Stuart, Johnny Appleseed of technology here, laid for us. 
Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Do you, oh, go ahead. Oh. Is it on? Yep. Yeah. Do you want me, do you want someone to hold it? No, if I can, if I can have this on my lap. Hi. Um, you know, just as Stuart um, has just said, I'm, oh. Ka I'm Catherine Fulton. Sorry, Catherine Fulton. And, and just as we've heard, the um, whole of catalog was about empowering individuals. Uh, Global Business Network was actually focused, um, which was founded in 1987, it's focused on big organizations, corporations, big corporations, government agencies, big nonprofits. And that's how I got to know Stuart, working with him on the staff there for nearly a decade. We have an unbelievable GBN alumni group here. Would you please stand and cheer if you are associated with GBN? Woo! Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to try to represent that amazing uh, group of people for a moment. Um, it seems like a real leap to go from the countercultural Whole Earth Catalog to global business network, right? But actually, I, I think Stuart, one of Stuart's secrets is that he was counter counterculture. Um, he actually came of age in the 1950s. And as he said, he was in the army. Um, and actually, you know, Stuart relishes going against the grain. And, and this is part of, I think, what attracted him to GBN. Stuart is passionate about learning and how to get better at it. That's, that, to me, is the thread that runs through everything. And hence his em emphasis on listening and asking better questions. You saw how he tried to turn it back on, on Pete. Um, and hence his emphasis on tools of all kinds. Um, which are the concrete symbol of his abiding faith in self-education and learning by doing. And hence this great quote from him, one of my favorites. Unmake victims. Start with yourself and branch out from there. <laughs> Unmake victims. Um, it's hard to explain what Global Business Network was uh, for 25 years. Um, it was a consulting company, a community, a think tank. My favorite definition comes from GBN stalwart Nancy Murphy, who's here tonight. She said, GBN was an experiment in networked learning about the future. Um, and it was always about connecting people across disciplines and, 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 and boundaries the way the Whole Earth Catalog did. And Stewart's major GBN platform was quintessential Whole Earth. He curated a unique book club that had the tagline, intellectual tools for the years ahead. And every year he would look at dozens and dozens of things and he would pick to tell you why he, he um, believed in it. And through the book club and hundreds and hundreds of workshops and meetings, um, Stewart slowly educated a generation of business people. Um, I'm almost done about new ways of seeing the world. Um, for instance, the importance of the environment as a major driver in business, um, and the uses of biological metaphors. You've talked about biology, but what does that mean? Biology was not about sports metaphors or military ones, but business is ultimately about relationships and co-evolution in self-organizing systems that you don't control. And that was a profound idea. I carry one particular idea inside me that I learned from Stuart, um, always make choices that open up options. Always make choices that open up options. And I think that's a profound insight about the way through many of the challenges of our time. I'm sure that choosing to listen to Stuart <coughs> opened up my life. Peter. No. Peter Calthorpe. I'm going to pick up on the, uh, well, first I want to say impacted by Stuart, uh, the Trips Festival, and watching this crazy man in a top hat try to orchestrate lights from a, a, some uh, a really crazy scaffolding. Well, of course. I was 16 years old, and it all started at that point. So actually, that's all I really have to say about Stuart. <laughs> Look, um, my lineage, my line has been in community planning and architecture. And, uh, and that comes from an intersection between two unlikely folks, Buckminster Fuller and Jane Jacobs. And if you can imagine those two married with a son, <laughs> there he is. Um, 
But when you think about the philosophy of those two people, it, it's really kind of incredible. And that tension is what's led, I think, to a revolution in the way we think about the built environment. We were hippies on communes. It didn't work. So we decided we had to remake the rest of the world into a kind of community and make our cities more oriented towards community and place uh, and history. And uh, it's been a long struggle, but it's been unbelievably fruitful. So the legacy here is really remarkable. Your book on how buildings learn uh, is so influential in architecture. I would say we didn't really succeed in turning the architecture. I mean, the monumentalism that comes out of architects' brains is still um, pathetic and, and really destructive. And yet there's a whole dimension of the architecture world now that's very serious about energy and conservation. And the moment you pull that thread of the sweater, all of a sudden you get to all sorts of other really benign things like um, natural light, natural ventilation, open spaces, community spaces. If you go down the lineage of, of community design, um, we all helped form a group called the Congress for New Urbanism, which kind of took Jane Jacobs' ideas and move them forward into how we shape cities. And they are now normative in the planning and urban design world. There's not a single person out there that is active in this domain that doesn't think about transit-oriented development, walkability, diversity, mixed use, uh, human scale, public space. Those are all uh, uh, standard in this domain. Oh, walkability. Well, you know, at one point in my life, I was living on the uh, on the South 40 with Stuart and a bunch of other people. Houseboats, yeah. And of course, uh, the car was back there and the boat was out there and in between in the night was a lot of dog shit. But <laughs> we had to walk every day, all the time to get to and from our house. And we knew each other and it was a community. So here's the simplest thing in the world. If you don't walk, you don't know your place. You can't feel it. If you experience the environment at 60 miles an hour, you design the environment for 60 mile an hour snapshots. If you experience it at five miles an hour, you think of it in a totally different way, at a totally different scale. Now I will say, and this is kind of risky, because these legacy things sometimes become so popular that they may implode on themselves. And I will say that my latest work has been in China, where they were building uh, 300,000 population, 300 million populations worth of cities, just as we had built urban renewal, towers in the park, the absolute wrong paradigm. And by taking these ideas that flowed through this whole tradition of Jane Jacobs and Bucky Fuller um, and turning them into principles and standards, they now have been adopted in China. Now, who knows what kind of obscure and nasty mix will come out of it, but that's part of the path. We don't know, um, but there is a contribution, there is lineage there. Thank Fantastic. You. Orville Schell. I want to read for you uh, something that I wrote about Stuart uh, back in 1977 as his ideas that really came out of the Whole Earth Catalog and then into the Coevolution Quarterly got actually inseminated into government. This was Stuart's great hurrah as a bureaucrat. So. <laughs> Stuart Brand sits with his feet upon his cluttered desk. The walls of his office are fashioned with cardboard boxes filled with back issues of the Coevolution Quarterly, a magazine which spun off from the Whole Earth Catalog. Stuart is the editor of these publications. The office of the Coevolution Quarterly are located in a small, tilting building on the Sausalito waterfront near decrepit houseboats. The signs from the building's former incarnation as Harvey's lunch still hang outside. To say that this office is unpretentious would overstate its majesty. <laughs> Brand also serves as a part-time consultant to Governor uh, Jerry Brown. As such, he has had an often unseen but nonetheless profound impact on California politics. Not only has he been responsible for arranging the steady flow of notables, such as Buckminster Binster Fuller, Herman Kahn, Ray Bradbury, Ken Kesey, Carl Sagan, Jacques Cousteau, E.F. Uh, e. Schumacher, Ivan Illich, that have visited the governor's office to speak 
with the staff and Brown himself. But an impressive number also of his contacts and friends have surfaced as Brown's appointees. Brand is a lanky, blonde man who looks a little like Ingmar Bergman character and was once one of Ken Kesey's merry pranksters in the heyday of the acid generation. He's been at his, uh, the established center of the counterculture ever since. How does it feel to be enmeshed in politics and working for someone else, I ask? Well, there's an advantage to being an appointee rather than an affected official, says Brand, who is attired in his usual ensemble, so bland that I cannot even recall it, except to say that his clothes usually look as if they had been bought and put right on in the nearest branch of St. Vincent de Paul's thrift shop. <laughs> when Brand first began working at the governor's office, uh, he felt somehow compelled to wear a three-piece suit the concept was good, but this particular piece of haberdashery hung on him like a shroud over an unveiled statue. I don't see myself as representing anyone, says Brand, clasping his hands behind his head. I've got two customers. One is my boss, Jerry Brown. The other is my client, the state of California. In terms of actually being the house hippie and representing, representing some sort of group of people, forget it. Politics is so much more a process than I realized, he said. I do very little reading, no writing, an enormous quantity of meeting, being available, talking on the phone. That sea of pink slips, of unreturned phone calls, just keeps piling up on the desk. There are a lot of process and very little product. One thing I think the office is remarkable for here in the governor's uh, uh, in the Capitol, is that anyone who works for Brown feels heard and heeded. He actually consults and responds to people. I've noticed that the press sometimes gets a little boggled by him when he does, uh, uh, w w w when he does it to them. They think he's being patronizing when he asks them what they think. The usual thing is that Brown accepts a very, very wide range of people around him. One thing that I think I've come to realize is that the office actually doesn't have much power. I think that everyone that finally gets into politics finds this out, whether it's being a governor or a president. The only, one, uh, the only moves that are left are fairly small, subtle ones that have to be done adroitly. Brown is now able to say things like, you should get credit for things you don't do, as well as for those things you do. A lot of Brown's flashiness and good moves tend to be fairly symbolic, like the Arts Council, which Stewart headed, uh, the Office of Appropriate Technology, that was a first, the California Conservation Corps. You don't have to do much to encourage appropriate technology, says Stewart. If a fair wind blows uh, from high office, these things will come into their own. A lot of times, it's just a question of reducing obstruction. You sort of fly the symbol out there Either it gets picked up or it doesn't. Okay, says Stuart, time for volleyball. Brand enthusiastically jumps up, takes, to his, takes his feet off the top of his desk, and stepping out the door into a small mud yard with a volleyball net strung across the center begins to play. That's it. Jane, Jane Metcalf, the co-founder of Wired. So um, I first encountered the whole Earth catalog at a hippie's house. And I was in high school, and it was sitting underneath the, bo underneath the bong. Um, and I immediately realized that there was something much larger than the world I had seen so far out there. Um, and one of the things that really struck me was that it wasn't so much about the tools itself that the catalog was about, but what you could do with the tools. And you know, at that point, my father was a banker. Anytime you needed something done, you called a professional. And the whole idea that you could do things on your own was kind of a radical idea for me at that point. Um, and, and really, that sort of started us thinking about how tools would change the world. So they could empower this generation of hippies to go back to the land, to live on communes, to um, withstand the man and you know create your own reality um, and that is a very fundamental idea that was so foundational to the creation of Wired 
And interesting what your comment was about, you know, set an idea free and, and watch the world run with it. And, you know, I think that's what we noticed with Wired is that once people started using these digital tools, they actually started to come together. They started to think similarly because the tools were shaping the way they thought. And so suddenly people from all different industries and walks of life were using these tools and having similar thoughts and that brought them together and that created this sort of instant community. But I have to say, I think Stuart's leadership and stature probably accelerated that. It didn't just happen. I think that uh, that was a big part of it. And um, you know, the other thing that struck me about the whole Earth catalog was how incredibly low budget it was. <laughs> you know, and so it gave a, it was somewhere in between like a Rolling Stone magazine, which at the time was still on newsprint, and you know, a mimeographed handout from my teacher in school. <laughs> And so that gave me the sense that you didn't have to raise a huge amount of money to start a magazine. Um, and of course, once we did get a magazine going, we decided to just go ahead and add some color, just for fun. Um, but it also, you know, the tools allow you to create facts. And, you know, as Lewis used to say when we were trying to get the magazine, Wired magazine, off the ground, we have to create facts on the ground. This was the Israeli settler notion of magazine startups is, you know, you can talk all you want, but unless you make something happen, which the Israeli settlers do by building a home, now this is my land because that's my home. Uh, so the tools enabled us to create those facts, and those facts enabled us to shed this sort of hallucination that Wired was happening, um, which I think really helped get it off the ground. Um, so sure enough, uh, we were making our own magazine, and we one day uh, read about the Media Lab because of your book. And as a result of that, we contacted Nicholas Negroponte and asked him for an interview, which he granted. Um, and from that moment forward, we were on his mailing list. So he knew when we, who we were when it came time to show him Wired. And of course, that led to him being our first investor. And so thank you for that, a lot. <laughs> um, and then I'm not really sure how the connection was made. At some point, the Whole Earth Catalog Kevin wrote a review of the magazine we were publishing then um, and where he called it the least boring computer magazine in the world, which is a great line. Um, this is Electric Word. This is not Wired. This is Electric Word, our previous magazine. And uh, so we put that on the cover of the magazine. That was our tagline, the least boring computer magazine in the world. And one day we met Timothy Leary. He came to a virtual reality conference. By the way, a virtual reality conference in Amsterdam in 1989, okay? Some people have been working in virtual reality more than two years. So Leary picks it up, and he's looking at the front cover, and it's got this trippy illustration of, um, of Richard Saul Worman, which we had done using the first copies of um, uh, PageMaker, actually. Um, and so it was all trippy, and we got the solarization wrong, and the printer didn't come out right, but it was a really cool image. So he goes, the least boring computer magazine in the world. And we were like, can we quote you on that? Um, another huge impact that um, Kevin... Stuart has had is um, his influence on the magazine was so pervasive that basically people still think he was the founder. Um, <laughs> whenever they meet me, they, they get very confused. Like, I thought Kevin Kelly and Stuart Brand started that. Um, right, exactly, exactly. So speaking of which, the, um, the, the metaphors are so important. And I was glad you mentioned that earlier. The, I was, had the pleasure of being on the board of the Electronic Frontier Foundation for ah. a very brief time. Um, and I just, thank you, yes, exactly. Um, and I just want to say that Stuart was the most functional board member <laughs> on the board. And, you know, that was where the board meetings were competitive metaphor generation. And it was a very competitive group of people, and Stuart always had the last word. Um, so I just want to say very quickly, that um, his, the stuff that he wrote in the first issue of the Whole Earth Catalog um, are tools that I am using today in thinking about what we're doing at Neolife. Um, that it be useful as a tool, relevant to independent education, high quality or low cost, not already common knowledge, and easily available by mail. So I think that says a lot about the kind of attitude about things that I'm still using today with everything I do. So, and of course, his final statement, um, my final statement is his quote, we are as gods and might as well get good at it, which is all about what Revive and Restore is about and what Neolife is too. So, 
Thank you. Thank you. We're getting the last few ones, and then we're going to have the, a lot more drinking than food here. Hi, I'm Fred, Fred Turner. Turner. And I've had the pleasure of writing about Stuart and the, and the whole Earth community, and a lot of the folks who are in the room are folks I've talked to, and I, I thank you for that. Um, so I encountered uh, the, the whole Earth catalog um, as something that completely transformed my understanding of what the counterculture was. I'm a cultural historian by training, and I got to graduate school in the mid-90s, and I found Wired Magazine. And there was Stuart Brand in Wired Magazine. And I had been trained by a generation of historians who said that, look, um, you know, the counterculture and the new left were kind of the same thing. Everybody was against technology. Um, everybody was against business. Everybody was against the state. And yet, here was Wired Magazine celebrating computers with psychedelic imagery in ways that summoned up the ghost of 1968. And I started trying to figure out how that worked. And the catalog taught me that the part of the counterculture that Stuart was so central to was a key bridge between dreams that had existed in the 40s and 50s and dreams that we have today. You know, when I got to the counter, when I got to the, to the whole earth catalog, I saw that it was celebrating tools, technologies, but not just any technologies. I actually went through and counted the types of things that were in each issue. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> books. About 80% of, of, the, of, the, of the catalog's items, at least in the first few issues, were books. These were tools for the transformation of consciousness, transformation of mind. And that was a vision of a different way of building an American polity, building a polity around shared technology that would enable us to have shared mindsets that would in turn enable us to escape the kind of politics that had taken us into the Vietnam War. And it was also a catalog that featured folks like Buckminster Fuller or Norbert Wiener, folks from an earlier generation that I had always been trained had nothing to do with the 60s. And of course, those of us who live in the Bay Area today have heard Mark Zuckerberg or Sheryl Sandberg or others speak to a vision of connecting one another through technologies in a community of consciousness outside the world of politics that in many ways echoes the kind of work that, that Stuart did back in 1968. So I, I see the whole Earth catalog as a bridge between a past and a present. And neither of those things was alive in our understanding of the counterculture inside the field of American history. And that's the impact that I think the whole Earth Catalog has had on, on my field. I just want to say one other thing. Stuart taught me something personal. Um, when I, Stuart, first off, spoke to me, didn't know me from Adam, spent two days with me, was incredibly generous and incredibly open about his life in, in that period. I've never experienced that. I learned a lot from that. Um, and I hope that um, I can follow the example of giving it away down the pike. Thank you very much. Fantastic. <laughs> Rusty Schweigert, former astronaut here, who's going to talk, give his little effects. After he puts his eyes on. Well, Stuart, uh, to, to deal with the first issue, what was the first impact Stuart had on me? And that, that was pretty profound. It was to bring me from the East Coast to the West Coast uh, to work for Jerry Brown. I was one of the people that uh, Stuart invited out to speak. And um, uh, that was that. I was looking to escape anyway, uh, but that was a good excuse. Stuart did that because I, he was listening to a tape of a talk I gave at the Lindisfarne Association in 1974. And um, uh, as he listened to it driving across the country, he stopped at a telephone booth and called me in my office in Washington. And I said, the real Stuart Brand? <laughs> because I was a fan of the Whole Earth Catalog at the time, and th that was the beginning of, of my transition into uh, Nirvana out here. Um, in terms of uh, what Stuart uh, and the Whole Earth Catalog and the philosophy, etc., uh, brought into space, uh, I think the most important factor was that space without Stuart uh, and me tagging along to some extent would have addressed the right wing, uh, politically speaking. Um, but because of Stuart and the whole Earth catalog and his fascination with space, uh, that clearly spoke to the hippie generation. And NASA itself had no way to speak to the hippies. I mean, it's just impossible. And I was also uh, a part of that bridge. So that was 
to me, one of the really important uh, contributions that the Whole Earth Catalog made in terms of the field of, of migrating or moving into space, using space. Um, I would, if, if you look at that today and you say what impact has that had, uh, I mean, all you have to do is look at uh, Jeff Bezos, uh, Elon Musk, uh, both of them and many, many more. Uh, were impacted by uh, the whole Earth Catalog and Stuart and the whole sense of openness and basically do it yourself. I mean, the whole message of whole Earth Catalog is do it yourself, damn it. When it comes to the environment, what Stuart brought to the whole consciousness of the environment uh, was that we are the tools by which the environment will be dealt with, not top down but us up, and that's, that is, we, we've taken that to heart. Now, whether we continue to take it to heart is, is I think, a big, a big question. And finally, uh, how uh, will this legacy uh, impact the future? I would say by inspiring five-star disruptors. Thank you. That's great. Oop, got here. Niles Gilman. So I first met Stuart 12 years ago when I was part of the GBN gang at a relatively late stage in the process. Um, but I want to talk about Stuart more in my guise as an intellectual historian, which is the way I was trained. Um, and one of the questions that came up with some people I was talking to about this opportunity a little while ago was, Mike up. up, sorry, was thinking about holism. Is holism the right way to think about the way Stuart thinks about the world? And I think it's not, actually. Stuart is not a monistic thinker. He's not a person who thinks about one idea. To take the old uh, distinction between a hedgehog and a fox, Stuart is the ultimate fox. Um, and I think if you look at the whole Earth catalog, it really reflects specifically the diversity of his mind. I mean, you think about the things that he reads. John Markov talks about how Stuart Brand is the most well-read person he knows, but wears it incredibly lightly. But just think about all the things that Stuart reads. Everything from technical manuals to Eastern mysticism, architecture to organizational design, deep ecology to software, systems theory, and of course, home chemistry. Um, <laughs> Sergey Brin talked about how the ultimate search engine would be like the mind of God. And I actually think that the whole Earth catalog is a little bit like that. But instead of being the mind of God, it's the mind of Stuart. It reflected the total diversity of interests that he had in the world and the things that he wanted to bring to the world. Um, and I think that that's one of the ways in which I think the reception of Stuart over the longer term, if we think not just over the last 50 years, but the next 50 years and the next 50 years after that, is going to be reflected by the eclecticism. Stuart talked earlier about how it had been a little bit of a random walk, one project def defining the next project, defining the next project. Um, and I think that that is part of what has troubled some people's ability to make sense of what Stuart's career has been all about. But I think in the longer term, that's going to be really intriguing for historians in the future, looking back at all the different things that Stuart did, all the things that he was interested in. How did he go from this topic to that topic? What's he going to think of next? I think all of us are wondering about that. And that actually gets to the last thing I want to just mention, which is that the one piece of advice Stuart gave me about my own career that I've really tried to take to heart is he said, look, you can think of your career as a series of blocks. In order to be able to make a meaningful contribution in any particular area, you need to put in five to seven years of time to really master the jargon, the specifics, the people. It's some version of the 10,000 hour rule that Malcolm Gladwell talks about. You got to put in that amount of time and then you can figure out what your particular angle on it is and make your contribution. And then if you think about your career, you start working when you're say 20 and you work until you're 90 in the case of Stuart, 100, however long you're going to work. Then you have a series of blocks. And you should think about it as a series of opportunities to take on particular kinds of things. And then you can do things as diverse as you want and build from one thing to the next without having to worry too much about a coherent story. So when I think the historians of the year 2100 and the year 2200 look back at the late 20th century and the early 21st century, I'm totally convinced that Stuart's going to be considered one of the dominant and most protean figures of our time. And it's partly because he's going to be hard to figure out. <laughs> People are going to wonder. Why did Stuart do all those things? And how could he have possibly touched so many people in so many ways? Thank you, Stuart. Ryan, Ryan Phelan, 
as we're closing out this section and going to the food and drink shortly. But let's get uh, Ryan Phelan to tell her thoughts. Like, <laughs> like most university students at, at Berkeley, um, when I was in college, I read the whole Earth Catalog. But it didn't really mean all that much to me until I wanted to publish a book on a community guide to nonprofits that I did in Berkeley called Savvy. And I looked in the back of the whole Earth Catalog, and I read about how to do it, and even the IBM Selectric font I needed to go rent, and pasted up my own book and hawked it around Berkeley. And when it came time to actually find a job, somebody said, you know, if you want to work in publishing, the only person to work for is Stuart Brand. And I went, bingo! So I'll make this next part really short and sweet. I worked at the Whole Earth Catalog for one year. I called up Stuart, by the way, and told him he needed to hire me. And he did. Um, and a year later, I did the Whole Earth Jamboree 40 years ago. So that was the 10th anniversary. And in doing that, we fell in love, and I married the boss. <laughs> so fast track, three decades later, um, three healthcare car three healthcare startups under my belt, and uh, I was working with George Church, the genome engineer at Harvard, as one of my advisors for my company DNA Direct, and I introduced him to Stuart. Stuart started probing lots of interesting questions. We went and visited the future by seeing George's lab and looking at genome engineering, and lo again, long story cut short. Basically, Stuart started a conversation with George saying, well, what can you do? Can you engineer something like an extinct species? Could you bring back a passenger pigeon, a woolly mammoth? All right, well, so that led to the next thing, the next chapter in our lives, which was really thinking together, what could you do for conservation? And I think um, really going back to Stuart's roots as a biologist, uh, really thinking about using these tools for bridging biotech and conservation. And I should say that along the way during that time while we were thinking about um, how to bridge these tools, Stuart was working on whole earth discipline. And as he said, pretty much was thinking about how to rectify some of the mistakes he had made, sort of inadvertently unleashing a lot of anti-science uh, sentiments. And in doing this work with George and seeing the future of biotechnology, we created Revive and Restore, which is now um, uh, working with something like 200 conservationists that Stuart and I have galvanized. Primarily, this has happened through uh, him really being a, a, a force of nature online with over 200 scientists, really giving them permission, giving them agency, and empowering a field that has been really, really traditional conservationists. And as we say, we're building the 21st century toolkit for conservation. Um. Tim. Tim O'Reilly. Uh, honor of being somebody uh, who's up here who did not ever actually work directly with Stuart. Uh, I, I once, uh, when I was maybe 20 years old, I sent in a, a short essay to Coevolution Quarterly, and it was accepted. I think I got $50 for it, but it was never published. Uh, uh, but I took that, and I, I grew up wanting to be this man uh, or be like him. And th when I started my publishing company w in the world of software, it was both created by new tools, desktop publishing. I could publish my own books. My first run of books were 100 copies. Uh, and uh, they were about software tools that didn't have any documentation. And we ended up creating the documentation for the Internet Revolution, the, the access to tools uh, that Stuart had taught me to, you know, to, to pass on. And so we created books about the Internet. And actually, the, the first popular book we wrote about the Internet, we actually stole his title. Uh, it was published in 1992, The Whole Internet User's Guide and Catalog. And uh, it was basically the access to the tools of the internet. And among those tools was the World Wide Web. And we put a catalog in the back of the book. There were only about 200 websites at the time. But it was like, wow, you can actually get at these things. And then we said, well, we can actually build the access to tools. So we built the first web portal, which was called the Global Network Navigator in early 1993. 
was the first ad-supported website, and it was the first catalog about a year before Yahoo, point-and-click access to tools, totally influenced by uh, Stuart's vision of how you shared knowledge. And uh, you know, I, I've, I've really been honored to try to follow in his footsteps as somebody who uh, spreads the knowledge of, of innovators, spreads the knowledge of interesting people, and brings interesting people together uh, in a, as many ways as I can. Uh, but Stuart, thank you for uh, all of the inspiration you've given uh, to me and to everybody like me. And I think what Kevin said at the beginning is absolutely right. The World Wide Web is the realization of what you started with the whole Earth catalog. Uh, it is a group of people who said, oh, we can share our knowledge, we can spread this stuff, uh, let's make the world a better place by sharing what we know. The open source movement, same thing. Uh, you are uh, the godfather of uh, so much in this world that has uh, done enormous good. Thank you. Fantastic. And our last final speaker is the man who is charged with writing the biography of Stuart Band. John Markoff for the final word and... So, uh, yeah, I'm literally the bookend. Um, <laughs> um, you know, when I started this uh, project uh, 18 months ago, one of the first things I did was um, uh, look at a video by Will Hurst and talking, interviewing Stuart, and the very first thing that Will Hurst said was, you know, I pity the biographer. And I went, oh, <laughs> shit. <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm a local boy. I wandered around the truck store when I was in college. It really didn't have that much of an impact on me. But by the time I was um, uh, sort of dragged into the personal computer industry in the early 80s, um, the first time I remember meeting Stuart, um, I had just gone to work for a little uh, newspaper called InfoWorld. And I was in Las Vegas at a Comdex at the Epson printer party. And I'd been, a starving, uh, I'd been a starving freelance writer. And I was standing in front of the largest bowl of cooked shrimp I had ever seen in my life. And on the other side, there was Stuart Brand. I went, oh, I get it. And you know, Stuart was, of course, dragged into the personal computer industry, too. And I think you know, the whole Earth soft review is one of those notions he might now admit was not, not the best idea. Um, but. Um, uh, so, um, you know, the, the la last year um, I've been um, at Stanford. Stuart gave his papers in 2000 um, to, to Stanford University, 54 linear feet, 124 boxes. Um, in 2000, actually, it's the second time I've gone to look. Both Fred Turner and I rushed in there right after Stuart gave his, um, his material to Stanford. Stuart, uh, I mean, Fred was really looking for a big picture. I was looking for one thing. Stewart had run the, the camera for Doug Engelbart in 1968 at the demo, the mother of all demos. And I thought, gosh, you know, maybe something, there's something in his journals about what he was thinking at that time. He was 29 years old, and I can tell you there was basically drug, sex, and, ro sex and rock and roll, and there was not a lot about Doug Engelbart. Um, so um, there are fascinating things in the, um, in the, uh, in the archives. Um, uh, you know, hopefully they'll someday um, come out and you'll be able to read them. I'll just mention one thing of hundreds that I might mention. I found a 1964 letter from Ansel Adderns to Stuart Brand, who was then a young uh, photographer, wannabe photographer, and Ansel Adams raves about the quality of Stuart's photos. He calls them extraordinary. Um, he goes on about him. Stuart did not become a photographer. I mean, it's just really quite remarkable to me. Um, so, you know, there's not a biography about Stuart, but there are now at least a dozen books that deal with um, Stuart in a biographical way. Um, all the way from the electric Kool-Aid acid test in the late 1960s to Woolley um, this year. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really striking. They offer you this Rashomon sense of the man. It, and, and, and um, you know, the, the, everybody basically uses Stuart's life to sort of, as the prism, to tell about their ideas. And, um, you know, uh, um, Art Kleiner is someone who's described this really well. And he, he basically is described, and Art was one of the people who, you know, Stuart found and brought into the Coalition Quarterly and has gone on to become a great writer. And, um, you know, he describes Stuart as a moral tale, Stuart's life as a moral tale for our era. And, uh, you, know, um, you know, you said it really well, Pete. It is that branch point between 
you know, the 20th and 21st century, and that is the sort of the cultural tale we all listen to. So thank you, Stuart. All right. I'll tell you what. I'm, I'm, we decided to depart from an interaction with everybody right now because to maximize the, the breadth and range of these other folks' insights into Stuart and the legacy. But we've done something different. We've actually got food trucks here, courtesy of Capgemini, more drinks, and we're encouraging everyone to stay and have a discussion with everybody here and all the folks that spoke. And I think... and. Alongside that, there's going to be an opportunity for some people to actually give their three minutes on how the whole earth impacted them and their fields on a side there. Some of you we've already reached out to, others if you want to, talk to me. Uh, but for right now, what I would just say is let's give Stuart a great round of applause and then have a good time and talk about this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Drinks and food, enjoy it. <laughs>